All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you all very, very much for joining us. I'm sure there will be a lot of other people trickling in here uh, as we get started. Um, but uh, I wanted to kick things off. My name is Scott Aller. I'm the VP of Marketing here at Core Software. And uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to welcome so many people. We had such a great response uh, in, in terms of registration for this webinar. It's a hot topic, and, and we're excited to, to have everybody here. We've got the uh, I think we had registrants from four different continents and uh, from all sorts of different industries. I think we have teams from all five major leagues in the U.S. Uh, on board. We have college athletics. We have agencies, municipalities, arts organizations, partners, journalists, you name it. Uh, I think we even have some students on here, and that's, that's really exciting for us. So thank you, everybody, for, uh, for joining us. Um, uh, before we dive into a lot of the content, I just have a couple of quick announcements, house cleaning things before I introduce uh, our, our moderator today, Adam Groh. Um, Adam, if you can go back one more slide for me, back to the agenda. Uh, today, you know, what we wanted to do is bring together a, a few core customers who are doing some amazing things in the data and analytics space and talk about how they built their business intelligence divisions and, and some of the challenges that they faced in doing so and what they're doing today. If at any point, if you're on you know, the Twitter sphere and, and hear something awesome that you'd like to share, uh, we'd love to know about it too and share it with you. Uh, we got a hashtag core insights. Uh, also, if, if uh, you, know, you have to leave the webinar early but you have a question that you didn't get around to, you can always ask it in that world. I'll personally be monitoring the social sphere um, and, uh, and sharing a lot of those as well. So uh, we're going to introduce everybody, and then Adam is uh, going to take you guys through each one of their different current organization structures and the evolution of their divisions. And then they'll dive a little bit deeper into some of the content to ask them, you know, what were their biggest challenges? Uh, what does their budget breakdown look like? What's coming next? Uh, what advice do they have for everybody here on this call? And then, of course, we'll wrap it up with some audience Q&A. And, and you can ask the Q&A through GoToWebinar. That's probably the best route. Um, but again, if you think of something way later, feel free to, to tweet it out or email us, and uh, we'll be happy to get you an answer. So last note from me is a really big thing coming up here in a couple days, MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. I'm sure a number of you on the call are, are headed out there, or maybe even uh, some of you are listening to us from a plane right now on your way to Boston. But uh, for those of you that are going to be out there, CORE's got a big presence every year. We have two sessions that uh, people from our staff are, are, are going to be a part of. The first one, Russell Scabetti, who's a moderator today as well. He's our VP of Product Strategy. He's going to sit on a panel with some really great folks and talk about the future of the ticket marketplace. I know one of the other panelists uh, on there is Jody Mulkey, the CTO of Ticketmaster, and there's some other really, really great minds on that one. And then later in the day, Adam Groh, who's today's primary moderator, uh, will be joined by a, a core customer, Carlos uh, Kesbers, who's the director of BI and ticket strategy with the Thunder. And uh, they're going to dive into a lot of the really cool and neat things that the Thunder are doing uh, in terms of data and analytics and how they're engaging their fans and, and uh, what kind of dashboards they're setting up. So. If you're in Boston uh, over the weekend, please go say hi to those guys. And uh, that's it from me. The next 60 minutes, we've got a lot of really, really exciting content that we're, we're so happy to bring you guys and great panelists. Uh, I'm going to introduce Adam Groh, finally, our Director of Customer Success. Adam is, uh, is the head moderator today, and so he's going to take you through everything else. So Adam, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Scott, and welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, as Scott mentioned, we have a really great uh, crew with us today. Um, I'm joined by Russell Scabetti uh, from CORE, our VP of Product Strategy. Um, he'll kind of be uh, moderating in the background, watching over Q&A, watching over the polls. Um, but our three main panelists um, are three people I've known for quite some time, since uh, before I was at CORE and I was at the Utah Jazz. Um, Jeremy Short, Vice President of Business Intelligence at Cronky Sports and Entertainment in Denver, Colorado. Um, Laura Meyer, uh, again, another Vice President of Business Intelligence um, with the Minnesota Timberwolves and Lynx. And Kevin O'Toole, uh, VP of Business Intelligence for the Cleveland Cavaliers. Um, so they'll be joining us in just a few brief moment, moments. Um, but we wanted to 
kind of kick things off, uh, make it a little more fun, a little more interactive, and do an audience poll uh, for those of you who'd like to join. Um, as we dive into today's topic, which is uh, building your BI team, your dream team, um, we wanted to know how big is your current BI or strategy and analytics department. So we'll pause here, um, and if everybody wants to join in on the poll on the bottom right of their go-to webinar, uh, we'll be interested to see uh, what uh, the breakout is. All right, the votes are coming in. Awesome. We'll give everyone so another thirty seconds or so, and uh, and then we'll uh, we'll check out the results. Awesome. So uh, right now uh, we're actually seeing kind of what we would suspect. Um, most of them are between a three to five. Uh, Thirty-two percent so far are three to five team members within the BI department. Uh, that's pretty average what we see. Um, pretty cool. Uh, you have enough people that maybe have someone that's running the overall logistics and strategy um, <coughs> and a couple people that are doing more so the coordinating, running the CRM, running the analytics, um, the reporting. 20% um, say, hey, no department yet, but we're planning on building one, and 20% say it's one to two people. So this is awesome um, because this is really about taking it from no department or just one person to building a much bigger group. Um, so we're going to kick it over to uh, Jeremy Short from Cronky Sports and Entertainment to uh, lead us off um, here. Jeremy, welcome. Hello. All right, um, so this is the structure here over at Kroenke Sports. Um, we're a young BI department, about two years um, now that we've been going here. Uh, this is what it is today. What we started off with is basically that left side there, the BI analyst, uh, the marketing analytics manager, and me. And it took a little bit of time to build it out, uh, about six months to really start bringing people in. And then one thing that we quickly saw as we were growing our department in particular, since at Kroenke, we're taking care of multiple teams. We got the Avalanche, Nuggets, and Rapids, so there's a lot of needs that vary between the teams, but everyone needs a little bit of focus. So CRM ended up being a huge growth area for us, so we ended up hiring two CRM specialists pretty quickly, um, each of them focusing on different aspects of our business. So one's focused on sponsorship premium, uh, Nuggets and ticketing, Nuggets ticketing, and then we also have someone focused on the Avs, Rapids, and Mammoth. Um, additionally, we brought in, um, just recently, we started an internship program here, which has been awesome. Uh, there's a lot of schools around Denver that have BI programs just getting launched, and there's a lot of young talent coming out of those programs eager to get some experience. That's been huge. In fact, um, our last hire, our last CRM specialist that we hired, came out of our internship program, so that's been uh, really successful. Very cool. And what was uh, it like when you kind of first started off? Um, was management bought in and they kind of brought you in to help build that? Or what were you personally doing there um, when the whole BI team started to evolve and, and start um, becoming an actual team and department? Yeah, um, so basically it started off with everyone was seeing other teams do some really cool stuff in this space. And it became obvious, especially with the size of our company, that this was a huge growth opportunity. There was a lot of opportunities on just understanding who our customer is, being better at executing our CRM strategy. So the executive team was totally bought in. Um, it, at, when you first start, it took a moment to you know get people used to, oh, I can go to the BI department to do this or to do that. And then it turns into a tsunami after a while. You just get more and more requests as people see uh, the power of BI and what, what that department can do. So that's something that, that's evolved um, over the course of these two years. Very cool. Awesome. Um, okay, well, we'll just transition over here, um, unless you have anything else to add, Jeremy, uh, to Laura Meyer uh, with Minnesota. Hello, everyone. All right, so this is our current business intelligence team. Um, we started from a combination of a revenue strategy team, which reported directly up to um, the CRO, 
and an analytics and research team which was living under the CMO. So the two departments at that time were kind of a bridge for the company um, on all things CRM, sales ops, um, you know, what we're taking to market, pricing, and then there was also some uh, data database marketing and email that overlapped into that. So about a year and a half ago, we merged into one area of business intelligence, and through some attrition that happened, um, you know, within the 12 months after that, we were able to take that pool of resources and, you know, thoughtfully plan out what um, types of folks we needed to, to hire in order to um, replace not only what we lost, but fill the holes that we thought we had, you know, when we combined all together. So that leads us to our current structure. Um, in terms of our strategy and analytics team, they focus completely on our uh, data and visualizations that come out of the warehouse. So all of our systems feed into that, um, CRM, the email system, um, our secondary marketing information, um, as well as some ancillary social data that we receive. And again, that, that populates into the dashboards that the entire uh, company can see. So we have some specifically for our sales reps, but then we have executive reports that get emailed out, as well as dashboards that they can uh, go into and play with. Um, for our data and CRM side, the biggest hole that we had was somebody to be focused completely on uh, the structure of our data, as well as the hygiene. Um, so that was a new position that we just added uh, recently, the data architect administrator, and I would say it's the best thing that we could have done. You know, just like in your own home life, when it comes to cleaning, it's often the last thing that you get to unless you have somebody that's focused on it. So um, we went out and, quote, hired the maid, um, but in a much, you know, more technical form, and he's been great at keeping everything up to date so that we can move forward as we get requests instead of going down a rabbit hole of trying to solve to why this data looks weird, et cetera. Um, we also doubled our CRM um, resources in order to not just collect the information, but then instead use it wisely. So our focus now with our data and CRM manager is more um, forward-facing, outgoing demand generation, marketing automation, lead nurturing, um, and then our analyst assists with that in our segmentation and profiling so that we can customize our um, targeting that we serve to our fans. Very cool. Um, yeah, I was just up there uh, recently working with you guys for a couple days. Uh, I'd say it was a very productive three days up there um, on site with you guys. And I, the, the data architect or admin, I don't know if he'd appreciate being called a maid, but um, yeah, I, I think it's such an important piece as you become a more advanced BI team to have this. Um, versus relying on like someone like Core to say come in and build all these custom um, workflows and entities, having that in house, it allows you to become a lot more um, flexible in what you're doing and what your data you're gathering in as well as maintaining it and keeping it clean. Right? Um, have, have you seen that been a huge benefit as well as you know helping write your own processes and procedures and workflows internally versus relying on someone like us? Uh, absolutely. I, I feel like our progress has gone exponential just by having him in place. And of course, the term made, we mean that in the most complimentary form. Um, we've been able to identify, you know, real time where our our breakdowns are. Um, you know, he's he knows SQL, so he can write the scripts, do ETL processes, um, real time create fields that we want to add. And then he's also uh, just recently got a dev environment up so that he can kind of play in that world and not affect any of the of the day to day that the reps are doing. Yeah, yeah, it it, it was fun. It, it was nice to be able to say, hey, you know, you guys you guys say can core do this, and we said, well, you know, core builds around this piece within our standard PSS stuff, but what you could do is take this and that from what core is producing and build an extension off to get way more customized, and and we would sit there and all of a sudden he'd rip out some code to help us with that. So, um, I, I it was a really cool addition, and you know, I think. It's something that every BI team, as they grow and become more advanced, they need to make sure they circle that and have that as a part of their um, team. So, very cool. Um, anything else, Laura, before we move on um, that you want to highlight or talk about? Um, I guess I didn't spend a lot of time on our business analyst. Right. He, Ed, he does a lot of our models um, and projections, but he also crosses over 
uh, a lot into the segmentation world and into our dashboard. So having him have you know multiple talents, knowing Tableau and being able to assist across the board, um, then there's no downtime on his part. In fact, when there comes to growth in the area, looking to the future, it would definitely be you know a junior analyst that would join him. Very cool. And I know you touched on now, you've touched both on strategy and analytics group and the business analyst group, but maybe in just a couple sentences you could clarify um, for everybody on here what exactly you um, say the differences between the two of having a strategy and analytics manager and specialist and then that business analyst and potentially a future junior business analyst. Sure. Uh, the analysts are, I would say, a lot more technical when it comes to being able to use um, you know, modeling uh, platforms. So we use SPSS Modeler. Um, but they're, uh, you know, down in the details a lot more, building out the models that we use, not not just for um, segmenting, but we also have scoring models. We have um, game rank, et cetera. Uh, and he, they're also very familiar with the structure of the data. Um, so as we, we onboard new systems that are pushing data over, they assist with where that should go um, into the warehouse with our architect, where the strategy and analytics team is pure reports, uh, visualizations. Um, they also are in charge of survey and research and and then making recommendations on how to activate on the data that, that they see. Got it. So business analyst, you could say, is kind of helping decide the inner guts of the data and where to push and how we're going to gain insights out of it. And the strategy and analytics are actually taking those insights and, and making recommendations from it. Okay. Is that, is that fair? Okay. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Laura. And we will now move on to uh, Kevin O'Toole from the Cleveland Cavaliers. Kevin, thanks for joining us. Yep. Thanks, Sam. It's good to uh, share a few insights today. I appreciate it. Um, so our team started about nine years ago. Uh, we hired one analyst uh, with a background in airline industry. And the primary function and responsibility of that role was to implement dynamic pricing. Uh, there's a pretty clear and easy business case that showed a, a good ROI. And, um, and that was the reason that, that that person was hired. And so after we had a little bit of success doing that, um, we broadened that to um, other areas of, of ticketing and ticketing analytics and began to hire a couple more people to support that area. Um, the big change uh, for us came in 2013, and that's when we uh, formed our own department. Up until that point, we had been associated with, uh, specifically with the ticketing group. Um, so forming our own department, um, not reporting to ticketing, creating our own budget, having our own leadership really enabled us to grow into different areas and have a much broader impact on the organization um, and enables us to grow into kind of the what you see here on the screen. So today we have uh, seven people on our team. Um, I would say two of them are primarily focused on the data side and um, four of them are primarily focused on the analytics side although all of them are more hybrid roles, and I think it's important that they have an understanding of both the data and analytics side to be successful. Um, so we have two people that are uh, primarily focused on the data, as I mentioned, uh, that's largely our CRM uh, implementation. Um, we also have what we call a process and data analyst, and the responsibility of that person is to ensure that um, the process or follow the data is entered correctly and that all the downstream process, whether you know for a corporate partnership business, for example, that might be invoicing um, or reporting is able to be done because of the input of the data and the process are being followed. On the analytics side, we've aligned against um, sort of revenue areas of our business. Um, that's the area that we primarily support. Um, so we have two people that are primarily focused on um, ticketing, um, whether that's um, memberships or um, suites and premium ticketing. Um, and then we have one that um, the analyst you see there is the CRM campaign management. Um, that's primarily focused on, I guess, what I would call marketing analytics. So the success of campaigns, where should our leads come from, um, and, and the performance of those um, is what that person's focused on. And then the other resource is focused on our corporate partnership business. Um, so we have a resource that's fully dedicated from an analytics standpoint um, to help us understand high-level strategy. And, and business analytics to help drive that business forward. So not as much tactical, um, more higher level business, things like what is the composition of the business, what industries are we strong or weak in. Um, if we look at our portfolio of, of companies that we have as corporate partners, um, where are we strong, where are we weak, those, those types of things. So 
that's a little bit of how we've evolved in the, the current world that uh, that we have today. Very cool. And you know, you mentioned that uh, you departed from the ticketing department. Um, so when you when you made that split, what was the biggest factor that helped you actually make that split and become your own department? Um, and what was the biggest chance um, that you took with, by leaving the ticketing department? And just more yeah, going so, to a standalone, if that makes sense. Yeah, so I, I think the biggest chance was it was something new, right? And we were under a pretty safe umbrella. Ticketing gets a lot of resources. They have a lot of focus. Um, they're a key revenue driver for the organization. Um, so it was a bit of a risk to go on our own and kind of justify our own existence. But it was really important because we wanted to spread um, away from just ticketing and think about ourselves as a, uh, a business intelligent unit that supports the entire business. So we started to do some corporate partnership work, but it was very difficult if we were aligned um, underneath of ticketing. Um, so that realignment and then owning the budget was a key piece of that transition as well. So people are very quick to give up items within their budget if somebody else is going to pay for them. So we started to take on the responsibility for some of the tools that were necessary to run the business, um, and that helped us develop um, kind of credibility within the organization of we, we manage those tools, and then we had resources to optimize them. Right, right, and and when you when you made that shift, um, I see it all the time. Well, I, you know, whether it was a team I worked at or teams I'm working with, um, when you made that shift, Ed, did you see sponsorship and maybe premium and everybody open up to you a little bit more because they didn't think that you were so aligned with ticketing? I think sometimes teams like they're so siloed in the fact that they think they're battling each other. Um, did did you notice that actual change happen immediately, or did it take time as well to say, hey, we're not just ticketing anymore. We are our own group looking out for, you know, the health of the organization. We're Switzerland maybe, if you want to say that way. Yeah, I think we saw um, that that immediate shift where it was, hey, this is somebody that's helping us and supporting our initiatives. They're not tied to other areas of the business or sharing time. Um, so they got integrated into the business very, very quickly. I think the challenge is culturally um, they weren't used to using data to drive decisions. And so going through that kind of cultural shift was still very difficult, even though we had somebody um, that's part of their team. Going to all the team meetings, um, integrating into the, even their team building activities, I think that worked really well from the very beginning. They were very anxious to have additional support, particularly if it wasn't something that was under their um, budget. Um, so, so yeah, I think we were accepted very quickly in that regard, um, but getting some of the small wins was important um, given the, the culture shift that had to take place. Right, right. Awesome. Um, okay, well, I, before I go to our next slide, I actually want to just shift gears here a little bit um, and, and kind of open it up to all three of you. And something that I've noticed as we've gone through these last three slides, and if I click back both to um, the Timberwolves and the Kroenke um, slides, is there's, there's a distinct separation between analytics and, I would say, CRM, um, what's called operations and system management, um, data management. Um, and Kevin, I mean, you said something about it being a hybrid role where um, the operational side and, and the data management needs to understand the analytics side and be able to think like an analyst and vice versa. An analyst really needs to think um, like a, an operation person, um, understanding how can we get the data and, and whatnot. Um, I, I would like to hear kind of just a little bit more from all three of you about why this divide is um, and the benefits of it and also some of the drawbacks from it. Um, Anybody want to jump in and, and take this one right off the bat? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that, Adam. Uh, I, the one thing that I would say here at Kroenke is we actually, everyone is definitely deep on the analytics side, right? It, it, more for us, it's the definition of what your primary tool is. So the BI analyst, her primary tools are. The CRM specialist, their primary tool is CRM. The marketing automation tool is for the uh, marketing analytics manager. So they have that main tool, but analytics plays a role in everything that they do. So we try, just like with Kevin, um, I'm, I'm a big believer in everyone being able to do a little bit of everyone else's job and having that hybrid approach uh, as well. I think it just makes us stronger as a group. Um, I, again, we're not a huge department, so if someone's on vacation, we all need to step up uh, to fill in that spot. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And what's interesting is I flip back to the slide, um, you know, showing your guys' org. 
chart, uh, you're a little more flat than everybody else. So I think actually that thought process comes into play, even though I would say, um, you know, whether it's uh, Minnesota or Cleveland, you know, you guys are probably both thinking the same way. Is that true, Laura or Kevin, um, even though maybe you guys are not as flat as, say, Kroenke? I, I would say there's definitely overlap, and they, they can all do each other's job if, if they had to, if somebody was out. Um, I would think the focus for us is better explained on the, the who and then the numbers. So CRM and data team is really managing the who all the way down to the individual profile level. And you know, strategy and analytics is, is more focused on representing the, the aggregate um, ticket value, dollar value, um, sell through on rate card, et cetera. Of course, they overlap because within those numbers are, are the campaigns and the people, um, but that's where the focuses are. Yeah, and I would echo a little bit of what both of them said, but I, I think the hybrid role that I mentioned is really important. Um, I, I think for us it's more a function of the evolution of our roles within the industry. So when we started, um, I think all of us have a similar story where it's kind of one or two of us and we had to do all the work, right, because there wasn't any other opportunity or there wasn't any resources we could rely upon. But I think as we mature as a business intelligence unit and as an industry to put more focus towards this discipline, I think what we're starting to see is the separation of some of the roles, whereas before it was one, one role that did everything from capturing the data to managing the data to managing the process, to doing the analytics, to communicating that for business value. And for us, the part of the evolution we're at right now is we've made a, a, a separation of the data capture and management piece, um, but it's still within our group. I think we'll continue to see that evolution grow, and you'll start to see roles like Laura talked about with the data architect. Uh, programmer, systems analysts, DBA roles. I think there'll be a further separation. Um, I think they still should be within one team because there's so much overlap, and I think they need to work very closely together. Um, but I think as we continue to evolve, you'll see more specialization, whereas at this point, um, I don't think there's a deep specialization, at least for our resources. They're much more hybrid in nature. So, so is that a threat then? Is that something that we should be worried about? Because I agree, um, kind of to your point, Kevin, like when I was at the Jazz, we didn't have a BI department per se. You know, we had a few people doing different things and, and trying to just do everything. Um, and so you kind of have to have wear those two hats. You have to say, okay, what's the user experience going to be like and how am I going to get the data out of it and know what when that data comes out, what I can get out of it as far as an analyst goes, right? Um, and, and also saying, I need to figure this out. How can I get this data the right way, right? So do you worry that maybe as we become more separated? Because it's interesting, I'm doing this um, MIT Sloan conference, shameless plug, with Carlos. And this is something Carlos and I are going to be talking about um, at the end here is, is, again, this separation. Do you guys see that as a potential um, negative to these teams that used to be very collaborative and almost now kind of separating a little bit? I, I don't. I, I see it as a very helpful and healthy evolution of our roles. Um, I think if you start to completely separate them and they don't sit next to each other and they never talk, then yes, it could become an issue. Um, but we're not Fortune 500 companies. I mean, I don't ever see us getting to a place where we have 50 or 100 analysts. Um, I think that would be the real threat as you start to separate yourself from the different roles. Um, I think we'll continue to evolve but still work very, very closely with those roles. They may shift around. You know, so you might see some organizations have it within IT or some have it within marketing or some have it under a chief revenue officer. But um, I think it's really important that they work together. And I don't see that as too much of a threat as an opportunity that um, we can get deeper and provide better support for the different roles. Um, just because I don't think we're going to get to a size where that becomes uh, prohibitive. That they're, that they're almost siloed within the group, that they're not having those conversations. Okay. Yeah, but, but I think you have to get to a pretty large scale before that becomes an issue, right? right? Like if you carve off some of the roles and they go into IT and you don't talk to them and you have 10 analysts that are different from, or 10 data managers that are different from your analysts, then I think you might get that problem. Yeah. Um, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but something to, to note that maybe we could bring up is when you're hiring then, are you looking for someone that you know can think dually like that? And we'll, we'll revisit that. Um, and then just one final thing on the subject before we move on is uh, analytics, right? Um, there's talks of analytics building reporting and the insights, but also building modeling. Between all of your different analysts and all your groups, um, uh, you know, between the three of you, there's a good, good group of analysts working for you. 
what is the percentage that they're spending on actually like building models um, and, and working in the data and, and driving insights um, versus maybe building out the reporting and, and that type of stuff that actually goes up to senior management. Um, anybody want to take a shot, shot of that? Yeah, I'll jump in. I, you know, it varies quite a bit on the time of year and where our focus is. Like during the season, you end up, you know, in the day-to-day -day grind of just um, getting out campaigns. So there's not as much modeling going on. And, uh, you know, sometimes it varies with the skill set. We had an intern. That's all he was working on was just modeling. But for our analysts, I would say at least a half her time is in modeling. Yeah, I, okay. I think it's similar where... I'm sorry, I think it's similar where depending on the time of the season and the particular focus, um, we're more or less looking at the models. Um, I think really more that what we're focused on is the communication of the information to help drive those decisions. I think that's the, the skill that, that we focus on more than anything. Um, it's one thing to have somebody that's even a PhD level statistician that can build models, but if you can't communicate that to help drive business decisions, it's almost wasted. Um, so I, I think we do spend some time uh, focused on model building um, in certain key areas, but I would say it's more around um, the reporting of that information and the communication to the decision makers to hopefully influence them. Got it. And okay. I agree with oh, Kevin. Ahead, Our time is spent pretty similar to Kevin. Um, the one tweak is that once we have you know a good model that we've vetted, it's more just about updating, tweaking, and identifying if there's different variables you know that over time are starting to to show more, um, but not you know re rebuilding the entire project, just more updates. Got it. Cool. All right. Well, um, moving along then. Um, you know, as you guys have said, you guys have all been a part of building this team up uh, from the very beginning. Um, <laughs> maybe each of you could talk about um, the top challenges that you faced um, as you started building your team up to these six, seven person units. Um, what were the different things you guys had to overcome? I don't know if we're going Jeremy, in order, but I, yeah, yeah, we're going yeah, in order. Jeremy, we'll start with you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, finding skilled talent uh, obviously is uh, one of the first things you run into. Um, it, it's a very competitive field. Uh, I, all businesses are interested in growing BI departments and diving into analytics. Um, and one thing that came up really quickly after that is you get people who either come from the industry in the sports vertical or maybe people who are really good at analytics but from a different vertical. So finding that right balance, uh, what's important for that role, is it that knowledge of the industry or is it the knowledge of the tool sets? And that's one thing that we've tried to do is really balance out um, people with some of the staff is purely from that sports background, sales, um, versus some are you know from totally different industries but have a lot of experience in analytics. Uh, the other factor for us that was huge is right at the beginning, you're not exactly sure who's going to want what and how it's going to evolve. Um, it, you know, some departments end up being you know, the squeaky wheel who have more of the requests, and you don't quite know that in those early phases when you're building out your team. Um, and so you have to be able to adjust with that and tweak your team and your skills to, to match what ends up being the demands you didn't know. Uh, you, you didn't know you didn't know, right, uh, at the very beginning. Okay. Well, Laura, what about you? What, I see that uh, finding people with experience is, is number one for you as well as kind of with Jeremy. Um, what, were, what are your top challenges? Yes, just like Jeremy, um, finding people with experience and industry experience and the right balance of both is key. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we use, as a team, we use teamwork online a lot, which is great for finding people within, within the industry. Um, it's a little more challenging when you're looking for specific skill sets, uh, especially when it comes to analytics. So uh, when we were recently hiring, the challenge was we were getting a lot of applications, but they weren't necessarily skilled um, to the point where I questioned if they had even read the job description. And on the, on the other side, we were, when we were getting candidates from outside of the sports world, um, you know, if you work for a, a big company as an analyst, that that can pay you know a good amount of money. That isn't necessarily what a sports team, which is a small shop, even though it's a global brand, can necessarily afford. Um, so it's finding the right amount of experience, but still within the budget that that we can work with. Um, and 
the proprietary knowledge that comes with somebody that's already done this in sports um, is a step ahead, you know, for a candidate. So whenever we see that, it's nice to grab to grab onto. Um, and then the final piece is finding people that want that want to work for us, that want to affect the business as a business, and not just have the sexy appeal of working for an NBA team. You know, we we don't walk past the players every day, and we don't necessarily build models off of this, the basketball stats from the game the night before. Every once in a while, we'll overlap on a project with the basketball operations analyst, but it's not very frequent. So if somebody was, you know, had the intent of breaking in through us but hoping to move over to that side, that's not somebody that we're interested in. We want somebody that loves CRM, that gets excited about data, and can't wait to find the end of the story um, when they're putting together that puzzle. Yeah, I, I actually, uh, funny you said that, I actually know a team that had a, a really talented analyst and um, the basketball offside came in and snatched him up or snatching him up in, in the process right now and he's going to go over to the, the b-ball offside and actually uh, be doing uh, analyst work over there. So they're losing a really good asset um, just for that, what you said, kind of being on that sexier side of, of the industry. So. Um, and, and Kevin, you have you have a couple different ones. Um, number one is not so much uh, uh, employee related, but just organizational alignment and fitting in within the strategy of the business. Yeah, first I, I would say what Lauren and Jeremy were talking about was is really important. So the talent management aspect, but rather than just kind of repeat what they've said, um, I think a couple other key challenges are around organizational alignment um, and then change management. So what I mean is making sure that everybody across the organization in every department understands what the overall data management strategy is um, because it be can become very difficult if there's expectations of a newly formed department um, and the resources aren't there to support that. And what I mean by that is particularly around the data management. So in order to be really successful, um, some of the things that, that we've talked about today in terms of hygiene and cleanliness and management of process um, and who owns the customer data and who has the ability to um, say yes or no on, on key decisions, that becomes really critically important for the success of the BI team. So I think making sure that those senior conversations happen and that there is alignment is, um, is, is really important and it was something that was pretty difficult uh, when we were first starting out. Um, and then the other thing I would say is um, the difference between reporting and analysis. And I think an effective BI team is spending the majority of their time on the analysis time, uh, analysis side. That's where the, the real insights can come, and that's where the bulk of the, t the time should be to maximize resources. But the challenge is most folks um, either don't understand or have a short-term need for a report. Um, and so creating automated reports or process to solve that um, that doesn't take away resources from um, a deeper analysis is, is a key challenge. Um, we've started to get into using tools like Tableau to create automated reports that maybe even get delivered to folks on a daily basis in their email um, so we're not producing them every day and that frees up time to do analysis. But I think communicating that and being able to um, communicate effectively with decision makers from analysis standpoint instead of just reporting um, is, is a key challenge that, that we faced. Yeah, certainly both take up a lot of time. So I, I can't tell you how many teams we work with and go plug in um, core and they say, okay, great, now just produce all the reports that we want and, and you kind of have to kind of set expectations that every team wants reporting a different way and every level of, of the organization wants to see it a certain way and they're just not something you just turn and burn. It's something that takes thought and building, um, which ultimately takes away from, like you said, um, your resources to actually do the analysis and, and build the insights to drive the strategy. Um, one other thing you brought up uh, was budget, and it's not listed on, on any of these, but I think all of you would agree that uh, budget is a huge, uh, excuse me, um, is a huge, uh, piece and challenge for everybody. Uh, if we go back to the poll here, let me look back real quick. Um, you know, 40% of uh, the people on this webinar um, are no department yet or one to two people, and then you can throw in another 32% that are three to five. Um, interestingly, can you guys talk about your budgets, the breakouts, um, and also the challenge of getting these budgets um, and talking about what it took to kind of get management to buy in, to grow the budget, to buy, again, more resources, uh, more tools to deliver what you need to be an effective BI department. Um, how about this time, uh, we'll start with you, um, Laura, and then go to maybe Jeremy, and then back to, or actually Laura, Kevin, and then Jeremy. Sure. Um, well, I hope my staff is 
seeing this, where it looks like our, our human resources budget is the priority. Um, while it's, it's very important as it can be a real setback to lose a staff member through attrition and the time it takes to onboard another one, you know, can set your whole timeline back for what you're trying to accomplish that year. But in reality, I would say software and tools is at least on par with what we spend on staffing. It just doesn't necessarily completely live in our budget currently. So there's some that lives in IT and then some that still lives in the sales area that as we you know, go through alignment year over year, it starts to accumulate into our budget. So I would say it's probably more half and half um, than what is represented here, but this is how it operates right now. And fortunately, um, you know, we wish it, it could be more. Our leadership has been very um, invested in you know, leveraging technology and making our sales reps more efficient and making sure that the engagement that we're doing with our fans is uh, vetted so that if a sales rep is engaging with them, it's somebody that's already warmed, um, who has participated in a level of content that, that helps us know that we're providing a service to them and not just cold calling, if that makes sense. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, there's not enough software and tools that we have now. We would much prefer to have an endless budget because we could, we could definitely take our revenue growth you know, exponential from there. Um, what we rely on the most is what we share through our other teams. So being able to have resources like Jeremy and Kevin and other teams in the NBA, um, that's you know, quote, free knowledge that we gain, best practices, um, where we don't have to spend to go out into a conference just by sharing amongst teams. We can we can acquire that knowledge. Yeah, I mean, all of you guys have about a five percent budget breakout for conferences, on sites with other teams, um, travel type um, things. You know, I, I think one of the biggest values for me when I was on the team side um, was going to conferences. I, I didn't feel like I was learning much um, at most of the panels. Um, there was good content and all, but. A lot of times you're already trying a lot of the things that they're talking about being on the team side, um, where I found incredible value with sitting down with peers, um, making those contacts and networking and talking about what they're currently working on that you're not seeing in the content of conferences. Um, Kevin, do you want to maybe, since you, we kind of have a call out for something you mentioned um, here, do you want to kind of talk about that piece and then talk about the rest of your budget? Sure. Um, so. Our, our budget is, I guess, fairly similar to the others that you see there. Um, I, I think the human resources or the capital we expend in that area is, is the most critical part. Um, it's the most difficult to get right. Um, there's lots of software and tools out there. Definitely some are better than others and, and ones that we've become familiar with, we want to continue to invest in those. Um, but I think getting the right people that are able to analyze the data and communicate that and, and impact change um, and influence decisions is, is really the key component um, uh, uh, when we talk about a budget. So when I find people that are really good at that, um, I'm more willing to, you know, they may start at a low compensation. I'm more willing and spend a lot of time going to senior leadership and saying, this is really important and this is the impact these people are having and fighting for additional budget dollars more on the human resource side um, than technology. Um, and I think, to, to your point, one of the things that we do, and, and Laura mentioned that we do really well as an NBA, as a league, is share best practices with other teams. Um, so as you mentioned too, Adam, I, you know, the conference isn't the important part, at least from our experience. It's the networking with people that are facing similar challenges and, and talking through those and then developing the relationships so that afterwards we can even follow up. Um, we do that uh, within, basically within driving distance to Cleveland. So we'll make trips to Detroit. Um, we share ownership. Uh, our ownership is also the owner of Quicken Loans. So we might go there for a day, spend some time with them and understand how they do BI work, um, go to the Detroit Lions or other franchise professional sports within Detroit and then drive home. So the expense isn't that much, but we get a substantial amount of learning from figuring out both in sports and out of sports how teams are successful at using data and what their uh, business intelligent group looks like. So you know, we'll go to Pittsburgh or Columbus um, and pick a, a non-sports business and a sports business. I think that's a really important part. Even though it doesn't show up so much in the budget breakdown, I think it's really impactful for us in how we can maximize the resources that we do have. Yeah, um, that, that that makes sense, and that's a smart way to do it. Um, especially, you know, kind of when you're in more of a central location. Um, Salt Lake wasn't great for that, <laughs> um, as you can imagine. Uh, but yeah, I, I totally understand that, especially when you have budget constraints. 
Um, Jeremy, anything you want to add? I know that you kind of have the same budget as all of them, but anything you can add to what they're saying, maybe why you're more software and uh, tools real, uh, heavy than, than human resources? <laughs> yeah, that actually has a lot to do with us being still a fairly young department. So at the start of the department, we spent a lot of money on software getting um, some new tools launched. Uh, so I expect over the next couple years, our budget will look more like uh, what Laura's does and seeing human resources really be the growth area uh, in our budget. And going back to some of the things that Kevin said and really using our, you know, the wins that we have and driving revenue to help uh, justify that, that growth in human resources. All right, well, I'm going to move us along. We're getting a little short on time here. We have a couple other things we want to address. But first, um, you know, don't forget you guys can uh, submit questions, and we'll get to those with about five minutes left. But uh, before our last two topics, um, we're going to do a quick audience poll again um, since we got great uh, response and uh, participation in the first one. How has your 2000 budget, 17 budget changed from 2016? Um, so we want to hear from all of you. Uh, down in the polls, down in the right, we want to talk about has your budget gone up, down, stay the same, or what budget? Cool. So we're, we're seeing some good trends and some bad trends here. Um, I would say that the two highest ones are we're seeing the budgets go up, meaning I think that uh, teams and organizations, senior management, are seeing, hey, the value um, in these BI departments and strategy departments that they want to increase budget, give you more human resources, more tools. Um, at the same time, over 50% are saying either they're staying flat, which isn't as big of a concern, they're not decreasing at least, um, but 32% are saying budget, what budget? And um, yeah, unfortunately that's, uh, that's um, not what we want to hear, but that's why we're doing this webinar is we really want to help you guys out um, and, and help you guys get to that budget um, in your own BI group so you guys can do all the great stuff you're hearing from our panelists. Um, so hopefully you're getting some good content out of this. Um, thanks for all those who participated in that uh, audience poll. This is our first time doing it, so um, it's been a lot of fun having these polls. Um, so we're going to quickly take up five minutes and wrap up here. Um, so we've talked about um, the organization and how you got to where you are today. Um, we've talked about staffing and biggest challenges. We've talked about budget. Um, guys, what's next for your groups? Um, you are some of the larger, um, more advanced BI groups in the sports industry. What are you guys going to do next? Um, so Kevin, how about you kick us off? Yeah, so it looks like you've got a lot of words there <laughs> under mine, so I don't know if I need to necessarily read those, but I, I think we've been focused a lot of time on capturing the data, putting the right systems in place, whether it's a warehouse or CRM um, or Tableau. I, I think the challenge for us is to really integrate all that to drive one-to-one -one marketing communications, or really any communications with our, our customers and fans. Um, so we have all this data, but what are we really doing to make it actionable? Um, that, that's really where we're going to be focused on spending a lot of our time. Um, and then the other two is broadening our influence. So we, I think we've had some good success within some of the revenue areas, particularly within ticketing and sponsorships. Um, I think we have a lot of opportunity in other areas, whether that's within our building operations or ingress or egress from the facility. I think there's a lot of other strategic questions that we can help solve, um, and, and I think that's going to continue to be a focus. Um, and then our data visualization, I mentioned that we're using Tableau. I, I still feel like we're in more of a test phase where people are getting familiar with that tool and getting accustomed to getting information from that perspective. And I think we really need to move past that and have it to be a, a true source of information that uh, business leaders are using to drive their business forward. And again, that helps us drive more insights and more analytics as opposed to uh, producing reports. Yeah, it's, it's something that I'm seeing a lot with teams is moving from um, um, or something like uh, SSRS. Um, unfortunately, like SSRS is, is a very complex program and not very flexible, and advanced science is very simple. Um, you can't get what you want out of it. So Tableau, um, again, you know, they're an OEM partner with us, and we have them very embedded within um, our actual software as well. You know, it allows you to be more flexible, and, and, and I think you'll see a lot of value as you guys go down that path um, using that. And again, you know, delivering that content up to management, I think, is what will help you get those budgets and get further buy-in. Um, so the, the better you, unfortunately, the 
would say this, but the prettier and the better you make those reports, um, I think the happier management becomes and the more willing they are to maybe give you a little more budget and buy into it all a little bit more. Um, Jeremy, what about you guys? I think uh, you can say it pretty simply here. Yeah, I you know I have an outstanding team. So what I'd really like to do is bring in uh, a group of people who can help them who are focused on a specific team. That's the hardest thing for us to balance is making sure one team doesn't feel like they're being shorted by another team, right? Because it's a lot to stretch across uh, four properties. So being able to have these positions that are right there focused on the team and free up some of our current guys to really be able to focus on some bigger picture uh, analytics. Um, and I also want um, Laura's uh, maid. That, that's the other thing I want. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'll we put that name friends. to rest. <laughs> Is it going to call Laura? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, go ahead, Laura. Yeah, so for our area here, I, I think I'll combine number one and number two. We just recently started um, working closely with our digital team. Um, to leverage our social data as well as what we're gathering uh, through IP addresses on website traffic. Um, it, it was one thing to be appending your data with Axiom Appends and Personas clusters and segmenting that way, but the amount of information that we are receiving um, through social and um, their likes, the brands that they affiliate with, um, that's been the new um, realm that we're diving into and has really led to some great targeted campaigns, um, but it wasn't a data point that we were previously tracking. So that's a hole that we need to fill on getting that social token, um, which will open up a whole world of, of where this person falls within our spectrum. Um, we're also currently going through a renovation of our arena, which has allowed for some great opportunities in getting involved with our um, concessionaire and their data, as well as uh, merchandising. Um, so we're rolling our entire fan strategy into an app that will be activated through loyalty. Um, that's where our membership program will, will fall into as well as you know just growing that one-time attendee into a single game buyer, into a multi-game buyer, et cetera. Um, so that's a major undertaking. Just want to analyze what are the drivers that, that um, you know, focus different behaviors as well as um, just having somebody that can constantly analyze that and activate it. So, it's going to be quite a project, but we're excited to see how that can take the business to the next level. Awesome. Okay, so um, last slide here uh, before we open up for a Q&A. Um, we, we don't have a lot of time, so I want each of you just to kind of give your one-liner best piece of advice that you can give to um, all our teams out here looking to build their first BI team or grow their BI team. Um, Jeremy, we'll start with you. Take your time. Uh, really talk to other teams and don't jump into something before you know talking to other teams who've done the same thing. Okay, Laura. Yep, I, I would say you know build a build a network within your local market, whether it's within teams or other companies. Um, we have it with our local teams as well as our sponsors. There's some great uh, people sharing um, and ideas that we've been able to to generate just by you know meeting quarterly. Cool. And Kevin? Yeah, I think by getting small wins um, that are quantifiable and you can build trust within the organization, that leads to more opportunity. I think if you focus too much on some of the, the larger items that might take several years, uh, you might not have um, the flexibility to do that. So if you get some small wins and continue to build trust within the organization, that will continue to get you more resources and more opportunities uh, within your organization. Awesome. All great tips from people who've all been there and done it. Um, so uh, we're going to open up. Russell, do you want to open up? Uh, I think we have a few questions in here. Do you want to give throw out a couple uh, for our panel? Absolutely. Uh, great job, everyone. We've got a couple of questions on the webinar and even one that we've gotten through Twitter. So we'll just jump right in and, and try to hit all three of these. Uh, first question was, and, and was definitely a key theme, where have you had the greatest success finding talent? Is there any specific background specializations that you target, like math, finance, IT, et cetera? Uh, and why don't we start with uh, Kevin? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it, it's a non-traditional hire within sports, um, and so it's difficult to use the same channels that have historically been used within sports to find talent. Um, so we look at um, definitely quantifiable backgrounds, so economics, statistics, math, engineering, those types of backgrounds. 
Um, and then ideally, it's people that have demonstrated that success um, for one or two years in a different industry um, that's actually really good and, and advanced and developed regarding business intelligence, and they can apply those skills within a sports context. Um, I think the last five hires we've done have all been outside of the sports industry um, with a little bit of you know, experience from different companies. So I think that's um, both of those are important when we're looking at new talent. Excellent. Uh, Laura? Yes, I, I would say the same. Um, we've been lucky with a couple folks just out of college um, that have had some great internship experience um, or are already into master's programs of relevant topics. So. Um, whether undergrad is actuarial science and now they're going into statistics as their uh, masters. Um, we also had um, somebody that hybrided in, in math and economics, but then also had a, a marketing major as well, so they can see the full spectrum. Um, but the internship programs that some of the other teams have started to roll out has really helped us because it's, it's almost like a full year of, of a real job for us, knowing that knowledge already. Nice. And, uh, and Jeremy, I know you have one of those programs. So is that, where have you had the most success finding talent? Yeah, the internship has been great. Uh, finding it from local universities, uh, statistics programs is cool. Um, one thing that's been a cool surprise for us as well is we have a large sales staff, and there's people who end up in sales who aren't natural salespeople or actually have a lot of uh, data background that fit in really nicely in the department as well. That's great. It's nice when you have those opportunities to kind of find find better fits for people within the organization. Um, that's great. Another question, uh, and this one is uh, from uh, this one is about digital. How much overlap or interaction do you have with the digital marketing team currently? Now, Laura, I know you talked about this a little bit um, specifically. So uh, why don't we start with you and then go to Jeremy and Kevin? Yes, it's one of our big initiatives for this year. I would say, you know, previously we worked together on the more traditional elements of providing target lists when an email was going out um, or assisting them with um, assessing like A-B testing on some of the images that we're using in the ad. Um, but now we're, we're all in, um, we've identified their platforms. The uh, data made, as we've quote termed him now, has been working on getting their data into the warehouse so that we can use it in our profiles. Um, and we've also taken their aggregate data so that we can roll that into Tableau for just regular reporting. Um, they're excited because there's a report that they used to have to do on their own, so their efficiency has gone up significantly. Um, but it's also been an easier way to uh, leverage the content that we have, because there's never enough content that we could be putting out there. But if we're maximizing what we do have um, and measuring the engagement with it, um, then not, you know, none of that is going to waste. They feel like they're being successful, as do we. Okay. Uh, Jeremy? Yeah, uh, we're basically in the same spot as Laura. I, I do think it's one area that we'll see us blending more and more over time because there's a lot of natural crossovers between the two departments. Great. And then, Kevin, how about your uh, relationship with the digital marketing team? Yeah, very similar. I, I think there's quite a bit of overlap, and, and I hope that uh, we continue to get more tightly integrated because it's going to be helpful for, for both of us going forward. So I think that's that's really important. All right, great stuff. I know we're right here in, in light of the, 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 the time where we're going to move on to uh, to our to our final wrap-up. So, uh, Scott, uh, over to you. Yeah, thank you, everybody, again, all of our panelists, Adam and Russell, and everybody that asked questions. This is Really great. We got some awesome feedback. Last couple of notes. Uh, one, upcoming conferences. I mentioned MIT Sloan coming up in a couple of days. Uh, we will also have a big presence at the USF Sports and Entertainment Analytics Conference as well as a seat in London coming up here soon. Um, we had a great mix of core customers and non-customers. And if any of you today are not a core customer and, uh, and want to see how this product works and how some of our products have helped uh, Laura, Kevin, and Jeremy do their jobs and, and help their divisions, please reach out to us. Um, you can get a hold of us through the website or email our VP of Sales, Taylor Kern. Um, lastly, for core customers, uh, you guys can all look forward to a, a note from me coming up here soon, inviting you to our Q1 release notes webinar where Russell will take you through all of our new product updates. Thanks again, everyone. This recording will be available to you here soon and will also be posted on our website, and uh, again, I really, uh, really thank you guys for, uh, for for joining us today. Take care, and have a great afternoon.
Thanks, everyone.